We're on uh, Peric uh, Membez Pusik Yud Tess. Which page? Membez Yud Tess, I'll tell you in a second. Page uh, 226, 224. Two th sorry, 234. 234. Okay, so uh, Yosef. <laughs> all of all of Torah anytime and now no it says Gesundheit. Okay, <laughs> on page two thirty four. Yeah, yeah. Takes a, takes a lot of people to make up a world. It's on page two thirty four. Uh, so Yosef accuses them of being spies. So we mentioned yesterday that uh, uh, Yosef, we, we mentioned yesterday how, how uh, the accusation is a way of preventing them from snooping around and asking questions. Because once you're accused of, the, of something, so then you're going to be extra careful, extra careful to, to, to not snoop around. So Yosef says that we're on uh, the fifth puzzle, sixth part line from the top. But Yomru. We are 12 brothers. The youngest brother is not with us. A father wouldn't, yeah, remember, Yaakov wouldn't send him. And one is not around at all. So Rashi brings down a whole, a whole uh, uh, what do you call it over here, a whole dialogue between them. He says, where is he? Uh, they said, well, he's, uh, he, went, he went missing. And uh, they said to him, uh, uh, we came here to look for him. And Yosef said, well, what if, they, what if they, it's going to cost a lot of money to redeem him? What if you find your brother, the missing brother, and uh, they're going to demand a high, a high ransom for him? They said, we'll pay it. And they said, what if they won't take your money? He said, then we'll kill or be killed. To that, Yosef says in the very next pasuk, See, you are spies. You came here to make trouble. He got them. He he cons them in and gets them to gets them to make a commitment. So then he does something strange. He says, "I'm going to test you." This is how you're going to be tested. The only way I'm going to let you go is if your youngest brother that you just mentioned, if he comes here, you bring your younger brother here. That'll see if you're telling me the truth. Now watch what he does here. Pay attention carefully. First he says, send away one brother, and he'll bring your younger brother here. And you, the rest of you, I'm going to put in prison. And then we'll test if you're telling the truth. Otherwise, you're spies. So then what does he do? Look at this. He puts them in the prison for three days. And then, I want you to do the following. Remember, I'm a God-fearing person, so I want you to do the following. If you're really honest, only one brother will be locked up. You go bring food up. So what does Yosef do? He says, okay, I'm going to lock up all of you and send one of them, one of you home. Then he says, no, you know what? I'm going to lock up all, one of you and I'll send the rest of you home. Why does he switch? Why does Yosef switch? He pulls the switch. He says to, says to the brothers, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm switching it. First thing he said, I'll lock up nine of you and send one home. Then he says, I'll lock up one of you and send nine of you home to bring provisions and bring stuff. What's the switch all about? So Rabbi Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky Zetzal, he said, Yosef is trying, remember, he's, his goal here is to get these guys to do tshuva. That's his goal. He wants them to do tshuva, and he also wants them to submit to him. And he's trying to show them, look, I'm a powerful ruler. If I could tell you, you know what, oh, by the way, I changed my mind, I made a mistake. I thought originally I'd lock up nine of you. I made a mistake. It's only going to be one of you. That means you could also admit, at least to yourselves, that you made a mistake. What's the mistake? We thought Yosef should be sold and we, we, we want to go. Even I can admit. Even if I can admit a mistake, so you can admit you made a mistake too. Okay? Admit you made a mistake. That's what Yosef is trying to prompt them. 
He's trying to prompt them to get them to, to, to admit. Now watch this. We're guilty. They said to each other, we're guilty because of our brother, referring to Yosef, page top of 236. We saw his distress when he pleaded with us. And we didn't obey. That's why we're suffering. We're suffering because we heard Yosef begging and pleading. Now, this becomes a question. What do you mean you heard he's begging and pleading? I was so what you decided he's guilty. So if somebody's guilty, so what if they beg and plead? The answer is that in Judaism, there's a, there's a line. Somebody may deserve a punishment. If they beg and plead, and they're really begging and pleading, that should trigger something in us that we go the extra mile of mercy. That means sometimes in life you're 100% right. Somebody needs a, I've seen this in yeshivas. A boy, a boy deserves to be expelled from a yeshiva. He's, he's, he's a troublemaker. He's a negative influence on other people. But if he begs and pleads to stay, that is a new level of consideration. He's begging. He's begging. Somebody knocks on your door and he needs a donation. They, they have to marry off their daughter. And a guy asks you for money. He says, listen, all I can give you, I, I, got, I got 50 bucks. That's all I can give you. Then he begs and pleads, even if you really can't. It does, it does, you know, there are rules, levels. But begging and pleading is different. You say, listen, we were right for selling him. We were right. We were justified. But he begged and pleaded. And since he begged and pleaded, that was where we made our mistake. Look at what Ruvain says. Vayan Ruvain osam lemar. Ruvain says, Hello, amarti aleichem. I said to you, al techetu bayela, don't mess up with him. Velo shamatem, you didn't obey. Vegam domo ineni dress. The ultimate told you so. They already said, listen, we're being punished for what we did. Ruvain says, told you so. I told you we shouldn't do it. Told you. You always love one of those, don't you? There's always a, there's always a told you so. But do you know when it's really enjoyable? When it's your kids who mess up, and as the father, you get to say, I told you so. Because then they learn, listen to the old man. The old, the, the old hound is still wisest. Right? I told you. I told you. I, I always had a, had, a, had a policy with my own kids. If I'll tell them something, I'll tell them something's not a good idea, then they'll do it and they'll mess up. Then they'll come back to me and say, now what? Can't help you now. Can't help you now. You should listen to me originally. Right? I was able to help you then. I could help you not to fall off the cliff. Once you're on your way down, there's nothing I could do for you. It's too late. What should, what should we do? You should have listened to me. Next time, listen to me when I tell you right away. Don't, don't be so smart. Right? And sometimes, yeah, I really can do it. Listen, if I could extricate them, I will. But most times in life, teenagers get to a point where you can't extricate them. Right? It's bad enough that they're teenagers. Yeah, that, that right there. If we could extricate people from being teenagers, we would. You know, that unidentified stage of life. We don't even know how. They're not even human. They're, they're somewhere between a cotton and an adult. What are they? They're a teenager, a new creature. It's a creature that, it's, 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 it's a creature, un, unidentified flying creature. It's a, it's a UFC, right? Just an unidentified flying creature. Teenagers are so complicated. You know, I'm so mature. You know, they want to be mature, but they're so immature. They're immature and mature at the same time. They're immature in showing how mature they are. Remarkable. We've all been through it. I was a teenager once. Don't worry. I put my parents through the ringer. Okay. So what's Ruvain doing here, really? Ruvain is not a guy who's going to come along and say, I told you so, ha ha. Okay. Told you so. What is Ruvain really saying to them? They said, that means that there's, there's an argument here between them and Ruvain. There's an argument. What's the argument? They said we were right, but our, our, our mistake was not listening to the, to, the, to the begging and pleading. We were right, but when he was begging and pleading, that's where we crossed the line. And Ruvain's coming back and saying to them, no, you were wrong to begin with. He's not saying I told you so. In other words, what Ruvain is saying to them is, what are they trying to do at this point? This is much deeper than it sounds like. It's not just a bunch of guys. It's not like you and your brother having an argument about why you're in trouble with your parents. I told you we shouldn't have. I told you we shouldn't take the car without asking. I'm not one of those, right? You know, but we were speeding. That was a, no, no, that's, a, that's not the argument here. The argument here is, what do I need to do tshuva for? 
you're talking about the Shvatim over here. If we made a mistake, we got to do tshuva. What do we need to do tshuva for? We need to do tshuva because we heard him begging and we, didn't, we weren't merciful enough. That's why we need to do tshuva. And Ruben is saying, that's, no, you're making a mistake. When you do tshuva, you got to do tshuva for, for the Avera start to finish. you got to do tshuva not just because he was begging. you got to do tshuva because you made a mistake to begin with. He's only a yelled. al tu by yelled. He was a yelled. He's childish. He wasn't a minor. He was 17. But everything he was doing was childish. You shouldn't have taken it so seriously. You shouldn't have taken it such a, such a threat. That's what Ruben was saying. al tu by yelled. What did he get all the hits about? So he went and he told a story about you that you're ripping the limbs off of living, living creatures or whatever it was that you were doing. But he's al tu by He's just being childish. So you want to do tshuva? That's what you got to do tshuva for. Okay. They didn't know Yosef was hearing this. Yosef's overhearing the entire conversation because there was an interpreter. Remember, Yosef had an interpreter between them. He didn't, he, they, didn't know that he, they didn't know that Yosef knows what they're saying because Yosef spoke Egyptian to his interpreter and had the interpreter speak to them. He has got a, a Lashon HaKodesh interpreter. Do you know, I know a guy who is a, I know a, guy who's a, uh, a, a Kashra supervisor. He, he, he goes to Japan regularly. He's a very, very, very uh, prominent uh, kashrus mashgiach. So a lot of time, he, a lot of his, his time is spent in Japan, in the factories in Japan. And Shab- what's interesting is that Shabbos, you know, he'll go away from home for two, three weeks at a time. On Shabbos, he flies to China for Shabbos. You know why? The, exactly, the international dateline. The international dateline, which day is J- Japan, is farther east than China. So for Shabbos, he's in, Jap- he's, he's in Japan, but when it comes to Shabbos in Japan, there's always the question of, is which day do we keep? Is, is Japan, because of the way the international date line works, this was the, the, the dilemma the Mir Yeshiva faced. If you know the story of the Mir Yeshiva in World War II, when they ran away from Europe, and they made it to Kobe, Japan. And when they were in Japan, they had Yom Kippur, and it was a question of, which day do you fast? Which day is Yom Kippur? Is Saturday in Japan the Saturday in, in Israel? Is Saturday, the, is Saturday is our Shabbos? Or is Sunday in Japan our Shabbos? Right? And there was a big machlokas between the Chazonish and Reb Michal, Yechiel Michal Tukachinsky. And the, the Chazonish, I think, if I was a Hippaskin, Sunday in Japan is Shabbos, is the Shabbos that a Jew should keep. And Rabbi Chukachinsky said, no, Shabbos in Japan, because of how you, how you calculate the international date line uh, from a halachic point of view, not from the secular uh, world's international date line has no bearing on halacha. That's just something that they randomly decided. Halacha, halacha decides, does it go through the land or go through the water, comes around in the water? Very complicated. So this guy, in order not to get messed up, he goes to Japan. By the way, there were people in the Bir Yeshiva who fasted two days on Yom Kippur. People fasted two days. Then they, they left. They, they, it was only applied. Then they went to China. They went from Japan. They went to Shanghai, China. So they, they would only apply that one year. But the, the, the international date line, it gets very, very confusing over there. Exactly how do you make the calculation? So this Mashgiach, he's there all week in, China, in Japan. Then he flies to China. So he shouldn't, have this, uh, he shouldn't have this confusion. He also likes Chinese food. He you know, so gets what he eats on Shabbos, a Chinese chont. You know, oh, so somebody else has a chomp, you know, has a Chinese chomp, you know, <laughs> eat it with chopsticks. So the, uh, <laughs> you know, potatoes and meat, I guess it's like Chinese food. Chomp is like Chinese food, because Chinese food is all very small pieces. And you know why that is, gentlemen? Didn't you Google that? Did you ever Google that and find that out? You know why? why ch- isn't Chinese food always a little ch- cut up in little pieces, right? Right. Well, well that's the, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the chopsticks? You know, it's not, if you would use a knife and a fork, that wouldn't have to be. So why are they using chopsticks? And they're using, it's small because that's, you, know, you can't eat steak with chopsticks, right? It doesn't work. You can't cut a steak with chopsticks. So why do they, why do they use chopsticks? Why do they use chopsticks? Because they believe culturally it is rude and impolite to cut food at the table. You cut food in the back room. To kill baby girls and bury them in the wall in China because you didn't have a boy, that's okay. That's, that's not a problem. You, you stuff them in there with the chopsticks, you know, make sure they're in, they're in real tight. But, but, but to cut the food in the back room, at the table, chas Oh, chas you know, you, you can't cut the food at the table. So that's why they use chopsticks. Yeah, that's, that's a fact. So, so, so the, the Chinese chont, you know, you know they take it, take it with the chopsticks. In any event, this Mashgiach Kashrus, this is to show you how responsible the man is. 
He works in his factories in Japan. He taught himself Japanese, but the Japanese don't know that he knows Japanese. How do you like that? So that anything that he hears in the factories when he's a mashgiach, and uh, you know, if, if all of a sudden the guys are, are you know touching pots, and you know, and he knows exactly, he knows exactly what, what, what just happened in that pot, right? Without them knowing that he knows. And Japanese, by the way, is ranked the number one most difficult language in the world. I don't know what they're what they're calculating, they're calculating how to talk it or how to write it or whatever it is, but it is ranked number one. You know, it's number two. Uh, no, Arabic is not. I don't think Arabic is that hard. Number two is is Hungarian. Yeah, the reason I know is because I was, did a program once in Hungary, and it was like I, I spoke in English, but they were also making announcements and stuff in, in Hungarian, and it sounded to me like an Oriental language. It was just sounded like, like like that, and I said to somebody, but this sounds like a really hard language. And he said to me, yes, it's number two in the world uh, behind Japanese. I mean, Chinese is no, no party either, right? But the, 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 what do you call it, Dutch. I've listened on the plane, if I've ever fired the floor on KLM, and then KLM is the Dutch Airlines. I've heard the Dutch announcements. I can basically make out what they're, what they're, what they're saying because Dutch sounds like English being spoke backwards. It's not that it's just that I can basically follow what's going on. You can pick up the what do you call it? In Chinese, you can't pick up, pick up anything. Right? The, 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 the what do you call it? Well, I'll use chopsticks. Yeah, I pick them up with the chopsticks. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Yosef does it. The brothers don't know. The brothers don't know that Yosef, that Yosef is listening. Vayisov me'alei and vayef. Yosef turns away from them and he cries. He moves, he loses the room and he cries. Vayashav aleim vayedaber aleim vayikach me'itam es Shimon vayosar salim. He comes back and he takes Shimon and he puts Shimon in prison. Why did Yosef cry? Why did Yosef walk away and cry? What's the plain, plain idea? Why, why would you think Yosef cried? Yosef walks away and he cries, right? So what do you call it? Take a look at Rashi. Well, Rashi says, Rashi says, top line, second uh, left cow. Vayevk lefisha shama shahayu mischartin. He heard that they had re- that they had regret. He heard the brothers are having a discussion about regret. So you know, Yosef's a human being. There's a lot of emotion. I mean, guys, remember, this is a man who's seen his brothers who sold him for 22 years earlier. You know, he's also he's also not made out of plastic. You know, Yosef is watching. His brothers are here, and they're talking in front of him about having sold him. Without him knowing, without them knowing that he knows, and that they and that they're regretting it, you know, they, you know, it touches something, and you know, it, it touches uh, some emotional cords in there. So Yosef goes off. Yosef backs off, and he cries. That's why he says he cries. So I saw one of the other commentaries says he's crying because he knew that he's about to put them through some difficulty. He's not happy about that, but he feels, <laughs> excuse me, he feels this is something that he has to do. Therefore, therefore, he, therefore, he cries. So what does he do? Now pay attention carefully. Yosef says, okay, fill their sacks with grain, and the money that they paid, put it into each one's sack. Put their money back in their sacks. So they go, they travel, and then look at Pesach of Zion, five lines from the bottom. One of them opens, they get to the inn, and one of them opens up his sack to give produce, to give feed to the animal. He sees the money in the top of the money in his sack. He says, hey, my money has been returned and it's in my sack. Their heart leaves them. That's literally, Vayetze Libam. How does he translate it? Uh, uh, how, did he, how did he translate? What's his turn of phrase? Their hearts sank. Their hearts sank. That's a good, that's, a, that's the English expression. Literally, their hearts left them. They, their hearts sank. That's why the article translates heart sank, because it's really translated to say their hearts left them doesn't mean anything. Their hearts sank. They trembled. What's God done to us? Oh, oh. I want to tell you something. The other day, I pulled a pair of pants out of the closet. I, I reached into my pants pocket. I found a 20, 20 shekel note that I had left in my pants pocket. I was happy. I was happy. My first thought was this must be somebody else's pair of pants. Right? But I was, I was happy. 20, 20 shekels. In the, I didn't, 20 shekels that I didn't know about. 
don't worry, it didn't last too long. My wife had to go shopping, right? So it didn't last too long. But my first reaction was, yeah. And if it would have been a hundred shekel notes, I would have been even happier. If it would have been a 200 shekel note, I probably would have made a kiddish and shul that week. Right? You open up your sack, you find money in your sack. What's their reaction? Oy vey. Oy vey. I've never said oy vey when I've seen more money in my wallet than I thought I had. I've never said oy vey. I've always said, yeah. Yeah. Right? Cain yerbu. Right? It should happen all the time. Right? Why are they? So, so they, they're, they're, what do you call? So what are they upset about? What are they upset about? So there's a musr, the, 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 the musr, the Bali musr say over here, when good fortune happens, all right, the plain, the plain meaning of the story is they obviously know they're, that they're being set up because they know they didn't steal the money. So obviously, like, what's going on? What does this guy want from us? But the, 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 the takeaway here for us is sometimes in life there's good fortune. And, you know, if there's good fortune, a person says to himself, wow, that's great. And I just won 10,000 bucks in the lottery in a drawing. That's terrific. The real attitude should be, it could be it's good fortune. On the other hand, maybe this is going to create a very, very difficult test for me. If I win a lot of money, it should happen soon. If I win a lot of money, that creates a new test. Will I be able to give the will I be able to give tzedakah the way I'm supposed to? And not only it could be a test, if there's really good fortune a person has to suspect maybe I'm getting paid in this world so God 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 could take away from the world to come. The Gemara compares a tzaddik to a tree that's planted in a place of kedusha, tahara, purity, and it's got a branch that's dangling over into a place of impurity. So what do you do? you got to cut off that branch. A rasha is compared to a tree that's planted in a place of impurity, and the branch branches over into a place of purity. So you got to cut off the whole rest of the tree. So the, 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 the Gemara says that a, 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 a tzaddik, he's got a little bit of him that's branching over into impurity. So you got to cut off that branch, meaning that sometimes the tzaddik suffers in this world so that his accountability for the misdeeds is taken care of in this world. Then he gets it all in the world to come. He gets all the good in the world to come. A Russia may get all the good in this world so that can remove him from the world to come. So if a person all of a sudden something has good fortune, so number one, I don't know what the test is going to be now with the good fortune. And number two, what's going to be in the world to come? In the world, maybe he's getting paid here so that, that he loses it somewhere else. You know, what's his name? The, uh, the, the baseball player. What's his name? The, 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 the Japanese guy. Otani. Otani. Yeah, Otani. Not ta- there's a, there's a, there, I know a guy named just Tani. Tani is you know, Yonatan. is short for Tani. They call Yonatan. People named Yonatan are often called Tani. This is Otani, right? So I don't think his name is Yonatan. He's Japanese, right? Oh, Tani. And so Otani just signed for $700 million for 10 years. Didn't know that, did you, Miguel? $700 million for 10 years. I get used to that, right? $70 million a year. The problem is if I had 70, yeah, that's right. That's right. $70 million. For this? Yeah, for not for doing this. Not for doing, th- no, not for doing this. For earning lots of money for the owner of the team. That's why he's getting it. Not for doing this, right? Doing this is just a way of earning a lot of money for who, somebody who is, I assume, a Jewish owner of a team. <laughs> That's what I assume. So, so a guy's getting 70 million. Now, if I was making $70 million a year, how much money do you have to give Tzedakah? 10%. 7 million bucks. And you're allowed to give 7 million? $7 million. And if you're very rich, you should really be giving 20%. And if you're mega rich, there's really no 20% limit. The limit on an average person is 20%. If you're mega rich, you don't have the 20% limit. How much is mega rich? If you got to ask, you ain't. Right? Am I in the category of mega rich? If you're asking, then you're not. Right? That I can tell you. Now, if you're mega rich, how much am I expected to give? How much of $70 million do I really need? I mean, instead of taking buses, I would take a cab every day. All right, that's 4,000 shekels a month, okay? That's $1,000, okay? Now, what do I do with the rest of the money? 
What am I going to do the rest of the money? Buy fresh pizzas instead of take them out of the freezer? Right? You know, exactly where's the rest of the money go? How much am I supposed to give? I don't know what the test is. That's a serious test. That's a very serious test. Exactly. The Chafetz Chaim, Chafetz Chaim had a disciple. And he was in the yeshiva. And he told the Chafetz Chaim he wants to leave the yeshiva. He wants to go into business because he wants to be able to, to give a lot of tzedakah. Chafetz Chaim said he should stay in the yeshiva and learn. The guy said, no, he wants, to, he wants to serve God a different way. So he left the yeshiva. He went into business, and he became a rich man. Years later, the Chafetz Chaim happened to travel to Vilna. And when the Chafetz Chaim, anywhere he went, people would come to the Chafetz Chaim for advice, for brachas, you know, people came to see the Chafetz Chaim. Like, so the Chafetz Chaim was there in Vilna, and there's a, you know, a bunch of people waiting to see the Chafetz Chaim. One comes in, comes out, comes in, comes out. There's, what, there's, a famous, there's a famous story that one wealthy man came into the Chafetz Chaim to give him a donation. Easy, yeah, yeah, easy. One wealthy man came into the Chafetz Chaim to give him a donation who was not Shomer Shabbos. There's a story about the Chafetz Chaim took his hand. He said, Oy, such a generous hand. Shame it's going to burn in Gehenna. So the Chafetz Chaim said, The guy was Shomer Shabbos. Yeah. I think he became Shomer Shabbos. So, the, uh, so this guy, this disciple of Chafetz Chaim, comes in. And as soon as he comes in, he bursts into tears. The Chafetz Chaim says, What's wrong? He says, I'm suffering from a terrible disease. I can't open my hand. Meaning, no matter who asks me for money, I can't open my hand to give him money. I can't, I'm, I, I simply am so stingy, I can't give money, I can't overcome it. So the Chafetz Chaim started chuckling. He said, you know, you made a mistake. You told me that you left, want to leave Yeshiva because you want to make a lot of money and give tzedakah. At that point, you didn't have any Yetzirah not to give tzedakah because you didn't have the money. But now you've got the money. Didn't you realize when you have the money that Yetzirah grows exponentially, he grows parallel to you? Right now you should know, I'm the most generous guy in the world. You know this story? You know this story with this guy? This guy gets called in by the Russians, by the communists. And the, uh, the, the KGB calls this guy in, yeah, this Russian citizen. Say, comrade. Yeah. Are you a loyal, loyal to the party? Yes, sir. I'm loyal to the party. Says, You're loyal to the party? What would you do if you, had a bo- if you had a boat? If I had a boat, I would donate it to the party. Good. And what would you do if you had a, if you had a mansion? If I had a mansion, I would donate it to the party. Good. And what would you do if you had a shirt? A shirt I would keep. So he said to him, I understand. A boat you would donate, a mansion you would donate, and a shirt you would keep? He says, yeah, I actually have a shirt. And he said, you know, if I had $70 million a year, for sure I would give $30 million to Stucka, for sure. You know why? Because I don't have $70 million. If I had $70 million, then it wouldn't be so for sure. <laughs> now I'm the most generous guy with other people's money. You've never met anybody more generous. <laughs> I'd give away all, all, all of Bill Gates and, 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 and what's his name, uh, uh, Born Buffett and, and, and Mr. Amazon. And, you know, I give away all their money. Yeah, that's only because I don't have it. Only because I don't have it. That's what he says over here. Mazos you, what has God done? Now, there's a deeper level here. The bro- this, is, this is profound. Uh, again, anything I tell you is not coming from me. This is coming from the commentaries. Commentaries say like this. The brothers understood. Right now, the brothers say, what's God done to us? That means up until this point, up until this very moment, they're being accused of spies, and they're being accused of this, they're being accused of that. And they figure, listen, this guy is making a mistake. This guy's, he, we're going through a lot of aggravation right now. We're already getting aggravated because this guy, whoever's behind that Egyptian, this Egyptian ruler is making a mistake about us. He's accusing us of spying because we came in in different ways, entrance ways, which was for a completely different reason. The last thing we're doing is spying. And this guy's accusing us of being spies. 
And now he's telling us, go bring your brother back. It's all, this is going to be very aggravating. Dad doesn't want to send Binyamin now, and I got to go home, and he's going to come back, and I'm going to like, the whole thing. But they've convinced themselves, you know why? Because God works, Mita can I get Mita. You get what you deserve. We made a mistake in our calculation with Yosef, and therefore the punishment is somebody's making a mistake about us. That fits. The punishment fits the crime. We made a mistake. So this guy's making a mistake. But all of a sudden, they see something happens that's not a mistake. Money is being put into their thing, which obviously is going to create an accusation. They said that much they see. And this isn't a mistake the guy's making. This is being done intentionally. At that point, they say, why is Hashem doing this to us? This doesn't fit the crime. Our crime was an unintentional crime. So why aren't we now getting framed intentionally? In other words, our crime was based on a mistake. We made a mistake in our calculation. We honestly thought that he deserved to be sold. We made a mistake. Okay, we can admit we made a mistake in our calculation. So this guy's making a mistake by thinking that we're, that, 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 that we're spies. That much we understand. The punishment fits the crime. But now he's doing something intentionally. This has nothing to do with us being spies. Now he's framing us somehow. And therefore the brothers are saying, what did we do? Okay, they go back up to Yaakov Avinu, and they tell Yaakov the whole story. And then Yaakov says to them, uh, 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 what do you call it? They, they, they find their money, and, and Yaakov's all upset. So eventually, in Pesach Lam and Vav, Yaakov says to them, listen, uh, I can't send Binyamin with you. Uh, Yosef is not here. Shimon is not here. Now you're going to lose Binyamin for me also. We're in trouble. 238. Ruvain says to his father, You put my two sons to death if I don't bring Binyamin back. Give me, give me the lad, give me Binyamin, I'll bring him back to you. That's a very dramatic statement. Ruvain says to Yaakov, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll put my two sons to death if I don't bring Binyamin back. What does that mean? What, 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 Yaakov doesn't love his grandchildren? He's going to go kill his grandchildren? What does that mean? Number one. So there are different approaches here. Some of them, for him say he's talking about a person who gets a portion in Eretz Yisrael is considered alive. He's saying, you'll take away the portion in Eretz Yisrael from them. They won't get a portion in Eretz Yisrael. But that, that's, that, that could be. That, that's what Maher Shah says that in the Gemara. But what's really happening here is, let's back up. Yehuda had two sons, right? Er and Onan. And they both died. Why did they die, gentlemen? Why did Er and Onan die? They were wasting seed, right? right? They were wasting seed. That's why they died. Who knew about that? Nobody knew why they died. That was a private thing. Nobody knew why they died. All they knew is that they married this lady and they died. What was the assumption that everybody made? You know why they must have died? Because they were the sons of Yehuda. And Yehuda was the catalyst in the sale of Yosef. It was his idea to sell him. So everybody who saw what happened, certainly the other brothers, when they saw what happened to Yehuda's sons, what they figured was that somehow that was retribution for selling Yosef. They didn't know what was going on in the private bedroom over there that they're wasting seed. They just saw, well, Yehuda was the catalyst. Yehuda lost two sons, cause and effect. It must be because Yaakov Avinu was upset with Yehuda for some reason, or he was upset at all, and therefore the two grandsons. So Ruvain is saying to Yaakov Avinu, listen, I know what the consequences are for getting you upset. Give me Binyamin even at the cost of my two sons. Even at the cost of my two sons. And again, this is because Reuben, because Binyamin doesn't know. Reuben, Reuben doesn't know what the, wh why they died. So then Yaakov says, no, I'm not sending with you. And Rashi says, you're a foolish, foolish idea that Reuben has over here. A foolish idea. I, you know, I was thinking to myself, it could be the Yaakov. Who was responsible for Yosef to begin with? Who was responsible for Yosef? Remember, Reuven said, he, he would, Reuven felt he's going to be blamed. He's responsible. So apparently as the firstborn, Yaakov saw him as responsible. Well, you messed up with one of my sons. I'm not giving you the other one. Right? Ah, what, I should trust you with Binyamin? I trusted you with Yosef, and look what happened. But then Yehuda speaks. 
Look at the end of the parsha. Yehuda just speaks up. What does Yehuda say? Page 240. Things are getting tight. They're getting hungry. Yaakov's not sending Binyamin. And the brothers say to Yaakov, if we don't bring Binyamin, we can't get any provisions. So on page 240, seven lines from the top. Last word on the line. Vayomer Yehuda el Yisrael aviv. Shilcha hanar iti. Send them with me. V'nakuma v'neilecha. We'll go. V'nichya v'lo namus. We'll live, we won't die. Gam anachlu, gam ato, gam tapenu. Anochi ervenu miyadiv tefek shana. I'll take responsibility from you. Get them from me. Im lo aviyosi v'lecha. If I don't bring them back, v'yitzag v'lecha, and put them right in front of you, v'chatosi lecha kol hayamin. Yehuda takes responsibility for binyamin. This creates a connection that's going to go on all the way through history. Because the tribe of Yehuda and Binyamin, remember when there's a split among the Jewish people, you have the ten tribes on one side, and who are the other two tribes? It's Yehuda and Binyamin. And in the Beis Amigdash, the Beis Amigdash is built in the portion of Binyamin, but who has one portion that encroaches on the portion of Binyamin? Yehuda, they're right next to each other. That bond begins over here where Yehuda takes, takes responsibility for Binyamin. Yehuda and Binyamin are now going to be linked together all through the rest of history. They're going to be linked together. But it's very interesting. You know, Ruvain says to Yaakov Avinu on the plain meaning, I'll take him. If not, you put my two sons to death. Forget about it. I'm not interested. Yehuda, he trusts. Why does he trust you? Yehuda had two sons who died. He knows what it feels like. Yehuda knows what it feels like. Really, it's easy to talk. This is, again, talking about giving away to tzedakah. You talk very dramatic about putting the two sons to death. That's only because he haven't had two sons who died. Yehuda doesn't say that. He's had two sons who died. He knows what it feels like. And he knows that Yaakov Avinu is facing two sons. Yosef is not here, and Shimon's in prison. So Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu knows, Yehuda knows what it's like to lose two sons. And I'm on the verge of losing two sons over here. Right? Yehuda I could trust. Yehuda I could trust with it. So Yehuda is going to be the one who's going to take down, he's going to, be, he's going to carry out the mission, and then he goes, down to, he goes back to Mitzrayim. Okay. The, I'm just speeding up very quickly, but at the end of the story, they plant the goblet. They plant the goblet in Binyamin's, in Binyamin's sack. Okay, that will have to wait till next time. Okay, we'll, we'll see that next time. Okay.